All right. So first half of the class, we're going to basically review the topics that are going to be relevant to the midterm, which is the Thursday after spring break. So, and you all should have gotten a number of emails from me this week about deadlines being pushed around and uh, various hints on homework for it. So we just finished talking about this before class. So we're going to go over brief review over exploit development concepts you need to know, network hacking concepts, web application hacking concepts, big picture stuff, and then what to expect. And then we're going to teach uh, return-oriented programming. So reverse engineering I won't be testing on the midterm. I more or less assess your ability to reverse engineer things in general on most of the homeworks, and I will be doing that throughout the class. The skill of reverse engineering is essentially it goes hand in hand whenever doing any form of exploit development, hacking, and vulnerability assessment. You're basically trying to figure out with a limited amount of information what something is doing. So, basic you know you need to know the basics of Stack Overflows um, and how they are constructed. Um, and so, this is basically on a single-threaded application. On a multi-threaded application, we kind of covered with like SEH exploitation that you can point to somewhere else, to some other module like ntdll.dll, and it'll always load it, uh, that particular one. And so you can point somewhere else and then come back. And so this was very relevant for SEH exploitation. Um, so I didn't cover it in class, but we had a homework question on format string bugs. So there's various ways to expose stack values in memory for, for format string vulnerabilities. And so this is a pretty good presentation if you wanted to look into advanced versions of this. And then there's also ways to write arbitrary values to arbitrary addresses. Uh, using percent n. So, um, heap overflows, I'm not going to really test. You won't see this on the midterm. It's just something you need to know about. We'll, pro we'll probably cover it in more detail with actual examples later in the class. It's not something that I'm going to test on now. So, basically, there are various features that attackers rely on in order to reliably develop exploits and attack systems. Um, before the modern security uh, executable mechanisms like DEP and ASLR, attackers relied heavily on fixed addresses of things, especially for return to libc style attacks. You have to you know, know where the address of it is in order to jump to it, otherwise you, you can't do it. <clears throat> you can't do it reliably, that is. Um, so, then also, early in time, the heap allocator would predictively allocate things on the heap. Um, that became randomized to prevent against uh, most uh, basic <laughs> heap attacks. And then also, attackers relied on having execute permissions in both the stack and the heap. So this all changed. Um, roughly about 2004, the game got harder. So Windows XP Service Pack 2 basically made the heap and stack non-executable. Stack cookies were in place then. They were part of the this Microsoft C++ and C compilers. <clears throat> there was safe unlinking. That's more related to heap exploitation. Um, there was a form of ASLR. And Linux followed suit. They had a non-executable heap and stack. And the, there was a partial version of ASLR. And so this, is a, this is a nice chart about the evolution of Windows security. Um, you guys can go through this on your own. I have the slides on the website if you want to follow along. So as you see, <clears throat> Initially with ASLR, uh, 
only certain things, like the process executable block, uh, the base location for that was random. The rest was all fixed location. So it didn't defeat all attacks that rely on fixed location. So basically, these executable security mechanisms try to detect memory corruption through things like stack cookies and checking that whenever a return is executed to make sure the cookie there on the stack guarding that return address hasn't been overwritten. So that's that code is handled by the compiler. Um, SEH chain viol validation. Again, that has to be something has to be compiled with that flag on in Windows. So, and then again, keep corruption detection. That's code introduced also by the compiler. So, there's other uh, other things like um, variable reordering on the stack for arguments to randomize um, the way variables are stored on the stack for function calls. And that was introduced by compilers to also throw off some attackers. And then basically the assembly would be constructed in such a way that it could handle that particular reordering. So. And so the thing is that even though your hardware and operating system may offer these mitigations, they may not be turned on. Like we saw with that O-Day, it was patched and protected against, but the defense was turned off by default. So many of these things, when you compile an application, you have to opt in. There's sometimes for, uh, I believe, I believe DEP, there's something that was introduced called basically permanent DEP, and it introduced a second bit. And it's the bit that basically means, yes, I really mean it, do it. So even though you turn it on, it may be turn offable as well. And so the code that's used to turn it on may also <laughs> exist in your process memory, and an attacker can reuse it to turn it off, passing it off parameters. So it's also really worth noting that phones that are jailbroken um, usually have some hardware support disabled, like NXBit, which makes them insanely easy to exploit. So, and smartphones are everywhere nowadays. And wait, didn't uh, Congress make it illegal to jailbreak your phone now? So that's that's, that's really why. It's good, some good lobbying there. Um, so, like I said, for DEP, uh, the application or DLL must be compiled with the NX compat flag. Otherwise, there's no DEP. Um, in ASLR, there's, they can be either partial or full. In stack cookies, <coughs> the cookie value is usually stored somewhere in the data segment. And so if you can debug the program, you can read the cookie. So if it's some daemon or service that's running and doesn't get restarted usually, it gets set once. And you can debug it and use it in your exploit. However, if you're trying to do something over the network, you probably don't have access to that system to execute commands anyways. That's what you're trying to get. That's what your goal is. So you don't have access to debug what's on that target system. So you're out of luck there. So what do you need to know for shellcode? You need to know the basics. You need to basically know how Need to, you need to know how system calls are made, what EAX is used for, what the rest of the registers are used for, and basically intox80. And then you need to know basically restrictions. You need to know null bytes. Probably going to see a question on that uh, on the midterm. Um, then for exploit development, you definitely need to know return to library techniques. And then the late, the latter two things, return training and ROP, I'm going to cover at the end of this lecture. So there's a lot of protocols on the internet. More than we can possibly cover in this class. So I've highlighted in bold what is going to be relevant. And on the next slide, I've broken it down just for application and transport layer. So the... The homework had a question on DHCP, 
the one due next week. Um, it's pretty simple stuff. You'll see very similar question. Um, definitely have to know the basics of HTTP and know the basics of SSL. Um, have to know the basics of TCP as well. Um, UDP not so much. I will probably uh, provide you guys the headers, like the Wikipedia diagram for TCP and IP <coughs> as a basically a reference on the midterm. So you don't have to memorize that because even though other classes like networking ha make you memorize that, in practice, I mean, <laughs> when are you ever working with networking that you, have, you don't have the ability to go look that stuff up anyways? Um, so specifically, uh, you should definitely know on uh, the link layer ARP. That's one thing to get familiar with. Um, you should know about the ARP cache. Just basically read the basics of that um, and how it relates to ARP spoofing and man in the middle attacks. Aside from protocols, you have to know basically uh, security mechanisms as, as well as, I'd say, internet routing because NAT more lies in the realm of routing rather than security mechanisms. Um, <clears throat> know the basics of a firewall. Uh, know how NAT works and how it basically uh, prevents outside connections from being established inside your network. And then know what we covered about IDS, IPS, and web application firewalls. So I believe in the last lecture I may have misspoke and said something like UDP is stateful. That's wrong. UDP is stateless. TCP is stateful. So even though UDP is stateless, you can do still protocol non-compliance checking with stateful firewalls using it. So hopefully that clears up any possible confusion it may have caused. And so basically stateful firewalls establish this state model <coughs> and follow it when connections are established in TCP. And if something, some arrow occurs basically that doesn't exist in this model, it drops that traffic. So we covered just roughly deep packet inspection. Um, so deep packet inspection usually occurs at the per packet basis. Now it's a big difference from web application firewalls because web application firewalls happen at the application layer. So a number of TCP packets could have arrived at the server, been reordered, then assembled into a stream of data for the application and sent along. So that is at a much higher level. And it's important to know how that, the, 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 how the two go hand in hand in defeating attacks. Because if you have an exploit that spans across more than one packet, it may not be detected by the, the IDS and IPS using deep packet inspection. So aside from that, you need to know the very basics of how to defeat deep packet inspection. That comes down to encoding, compression, and encryption. And you need to know in each of those cases what's required and enabled to utilize those. In other words, you have to have some way to decode it on the other end. You have to have some way to decompress it on the other end. And you have to have some key on the other end to de decrypt it. So <clears throat> each of these three techniques are used in various stages of an attack, sometimes, say for encryption, after I've owned a machine and I have backdoor access, I probably want to be using uh, encryption for my communication. Since I've already established files, downloaded files there, I can download my encryption key there and then I can defeat the intrusion detection system and do more nasty stuff then. But that's only communicating from the owned machine to my command and control network. I can't use that key to attack other th machines on the network to expand my control because the, when the packets get there, if they somehow make it to uh, a socket, the socket's going to read the data. It's all going to be all encrypted. It's not going to have a key to decrypt it. 
<clears throat> and so next week I'm going to give you guys a homework to do over spring break on SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Um, a lot of professors say spring break is not for you to go party, it's for you to study. That's true, because it's for me to go party. <laughs> so, know the big picture stuff, um, and that, that homework's not going to be too difficult. Know the big picture stuff. Um, you're going to see some questions on attack chains. I'll basically give you perhaps say like a small little scenario and have you draw me a attack chain. As long as you represent all the information, it's fine. I'm not going to be strict on any format. So um, attack chains are very common in the security world. Um, and it's probably the most common way to explain how this O-Day worked or how this latest exploit works. So basically, there's going to be true or false questions on concepts. There's going to be easy points. But the majority of the questions are going to test your understanding of the concepts. And then basically, in order to get an A, I'm going to test your ability to apply the concepts. So <clears throat> questions? I'm sure you guys will have questions later. I haven't made the midterm yet. This is three weeks, so I'll be making over spring break. So feel free to email me or ask me any questions between now and then. OK, so we're going to get to the interesting stuff, return-oriented programming. So <clears throat> for the record, most of these slides are uh, in some form or another taken from other resources. Uh, there's a talk at the end uh, called Practical Return-Oriented Programming. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that talk existed because it helped me put together a lot of this in a way that you guys can understand. So, as we saw, basically executable security mechanisms evolved to defend against various different types of attacks. And so, essentially, return-oriented programming uh, kind of spawned when return to library attacks were introduced. And so, return-oriented programming is very, very related to return to library exploitation and SEH exploitation. Here's a little timeline from a blog uh, post that's titled A Gentle Introdu Introduction to Returning to Programming. This is a great diagram. So basically, it starts in 1972, the history of exploit development, with a private document that was shared with maybe like five people on the internet, and on basically describing how buffer overflow attacks work. You know, only like five people knew about this in the world. So. In 1988, the Morris worm occurred, and I believe the guy who wrote it is an MIT professor now. Um, so he has an interesting career. Um, and that kind of shocked the world. That was basically, that was the major milestone as basically, oh my god, we're discovering these things can go wrong in this way. What do we do? <laughs> Save us, Superman. And so <clears throat> that was actually... That made big news, but it was all forgotten. It was like ancient history, ancient secrets and magical spells that were known at one time, and then that race went extinct, and all that knowledge was lost. And so it wasn't until 1995 where buffer overflows actually rediscovered. And they were tracked and talked about on a website called BugTrack. And BugTrack, uh, was used by a number of different uh, exploit developers to uh, announce all their awesome ninja skills and show the world how to do them as well. That and uh, sites like Frack. So, <clears throat> 1995, buffer overflows were rediscovered. Uh, Aleph One released a paper called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit the year afterwards. And then, in 1997, there were some defenses against stacks net mashing introduced. And so naturally, the discussion evolved to how do we break these defenses? And so the concept of reusing code that already exists was introduced to the world by some magical, you know, brilliant people. Specifically, if you really do get into vulnerability research, 
you're going to see this guy's name light. Solar Designer. Uh, he got, uh, I think, a year or two ago, uh, Black Hat awarded him a basically a career lifetime achievement award. Um, Solar Designer, I forget his actual name, also uh, is the author of John the Ripper and a number of other really awesome stuff. And so he gave us basically return to library style attacks. And it was basically, you know, super awesome magical stuff. And so <clears throat> two years later, return to library style attacks were introduced on different platforms like Spark uh, architecture. And then uh, basically code reuse techniques became uh, around 2000 more maturely discussed and explored. And so right at about 2001, there was an advanced paper published on return to library style exploits. And related to that was the code Redworm, which triggered Microsoft to uh, basically implement in 2004. It was, it was one of the first things, first series of major attacks that led Microsoft to implement in 2004 all those executable security mechanisms. And so basically, in 2007, um, Hovav Shacham uh, introduced return-oriented programming on x86 architecture in an amazing paper. Um, we're going to talk about this paper a great deal. And from there on, basically, this has been the history of advances, and they've all been academic. ROP is, until last year, was not really use in publicly discovered malware. So we're seeing ROP on the rise. And almost every time we see, like in Adobe O'Day, this ROP only escapes the sandbox. Like a week or two later, people are discussing, well, did a government write it because it's so advanced? Don't know. I'll let you guys think about that. But we're going to cover ROP. It's not that bad. Um, so, it's getting harder and harder to find vulnerabilities, and you guys are lucky to have this class because if you're to learn about buffer overflows and st smashing the stack, nowadays real examples of those vulnerabilities are extremely hard to find. It's not easy like it was way back in the day. I wish it was, but I also wish it, I, I'm glad it isn't because, you know, everything would be getting hacked and it'd be chaos. So it's also getting harder to beat the, the executable security mechanisms. And so I mentioned this earlier. Basically, it's, it's useful to watch the trends of bad guys. And this is from the IBM X-Force report in 2011. And essentially, things that are really hard to exploit are generally not that commonly exploited, unless there's basically a high value to attack it. There's a high value of the target. Still, the most widespread things are essentially uh, things that are really cheap to do. Don't, don't take a whole lot of skill and understanding for the attacker to use. And are, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for the attacker to use it. So return-oriented programming was more or less conceived in 2004 and a paper on how to defeat NX and DEP on, by basically reusing code that's already there. However, everyone credits, rightfully so, the paper in 2007 by Hovaf Sacham called The Geometry of Innocent Flesh on the Bone, Return into LibC Without Function Calls. <clears throat> the key lesson uh, from this paper is that preventing the introduction of malicious code, say malicious shell code, is not enough for preventing the execution of malicious computations. Any of you who have attempted any of the homework problems that involve return to libc style attacks know that when you're doing this exploit development, you're actually not writing any assembly yourself. You're just calling existing functions and providing malicious data. So you're causing, in effect, malicious computations. So, 
Return-oriented programming expands the attack vector for return to library style techniques by introducing control branches and structures and loops. <clears throat> so in other words, uh, return to library style techniques are kind of one off. You call system and you pass it bin sh. And it doesn't have any support for conditional branching um, because you are just jumping from function to function. There's no function that you can jump to that just provides a small little conditional check. Um. <clears throat> so it is common for uh, things to be stripped to make it very hard to do uh, returning to library techniques, but that provides zero security against rot, and we'll see why. So, before we get into ROP, I want to talk about some theory. So, in linked binary executables, the calling convention for function calls is either cdecl or std call. So, cdecl originates from the C standard. Arguments are pushed on the stack right to left, and the calling function cleans up the stack. So, right after call, you have to clean up the stack. In std call, whatever function you call is responsible for cleaning up the stack. So, this originates from Microsoft, um, and arguments are pushed on the stack right to left, I believe. So, we're going to use cdecl convention for this lecture um, because I want to expose you guys to the art of you having to clean up the stack. So, in essence, the function call syntax is you push argument two, you push argument one, then you call the function. And the stack is constructed as such. Now, because return instruction is similar to pop EIP, you can also uh, call functions in this way. And so using this and the normal way functions are supposed to be called, you can basically go about a number of different combination ways to call multiple functions successively. And so, <clears throat> as you're all familiar, return to libc conceptually, I covered this in the first lecture, um, instead of overwriting the return value on the stack and pointing it to somewhere at the beginning of your knob sled, you point it to go off to uh, existing code um, to simulate a function call. So this totally defeats non-executable stack, and as we as if, as we've seen, uh, is actually easier than writing shellcode. So we want to go beyond this. Say we want to do instead of just system and then exit, we want to do function one, function two, function three. We want to have more capability. Uh, than just this one-off capability. So what we'd have to do is we'd have to clean up the stack and we'd have to move the stack along as we're calling these functions because the, the function arguments for each function are accessed relative to EBP, the base pointer for the current frame of the stack. So if we want to call function one then two and two takes in some arguments, we have to clean up the stack before we can get two to work. So, this brings us to return chaining theory. <clears throat> so, remember this, basically, um, uh, the top thing on the stack is the return address when you're going into a function. And so, it basically will use that to return back. So. And the thing right after it on the stack uh, is the first argument. So say here the address here function one. We've overwritten in a buffer overflow the return address on the stack. We're pointing it here to function one. What is here after it is an address of some pop pop return sequence in memory. Could be in another DLL, it could be an existing code. And we point it there. Now what happens, we'll see. And we do this in such a fashion that you have, uh, you point it to exactly the same number of pop instructions 
And it doesn't matter what they're popping into the register. Um, that is actually irrelevant. And you can see out the registers if you need to, but as long as you find the right ways to pass the arguments, um, you should be good because the arguments are passed in the stack when you're doing uh, code reuse techniques. <clears throat> now, that is opposed to shell code where you're usually uh, directly calling uh, intoxating and passing the arguments in the registers. So you have to find ways to zero out the registers and all this stuff and so on. Not to say that ROP doesn't, uh, ROP most, not to say that ROP exploits don't use registers and intoxating and whatnot. But we will, we'll see. Before I digress, let's, let's go through this entire process with an example. So I have this memory address that I've overwritten the return address and it's to some function. And so when the original program gets to the end of that function that I've exploited, it's going to call return. And it's going to go on the stack and use that value to uh, populate EIP. So I've overridden it with my, my intended function that I want to point the processor to. And so that gets popped off the stack. And then the processor starts looking at the instructions that I've pointed it at. And usually functions uh, begin with some form of push EBP. So that pushes EBP on the stack. And then you have some logic to perform whatever the, the intention of the function is. And at some point, the local variables, the, the function parameters, arguments, are going to be used by that function. So that's the first one's going to be an EBP plus 8, and so on. And then leave is usually going to be called. And what that does is it restores the stack frame to the called, uh, to whatever the stack frame for the function was that called this function. And then it's going to return to the address provided to it. So here we, we point it instead back to uh, where we were on the stack and hope it executes there. We point it to some code that's going to clean up the stack for us so we can call the next function we want. So we point it to some pop pop return sequence. And so it could be like pop EDI, pop EBP, and then return. And these things are all over memory. I mean, the, you know, process memory. And so effectively, these things get popped off and return points there. And then we start this whole process again. Any questions? So this is for C decal. And STD call, basically, you don't have to point uh, it to any code that cleans up the stack. So we put the address of the pop pop return. You, yeah, you, you find some address for pop pop return sequence. Usually doesn't matter what it is. And then you push that uh, right after you push the address for the function. So harder, fast call so the details, yes, will always depend on the calling function. Um, fast call, perhaps. So return-oriented programming is essentially a combination of return-to-library-style techniques and return-chaining techniques. This type of exploit is uh, was used by malware to disable DEP on Windows XP Service Pack 2 and Vista Service Pack 1, uh, 0. So those service packs basically introduced DEP, some form of ASLR, and all uh, stack cookies and other stuff. So by using these techniques, they were able to essentially call the function to disable DEP. <laughs> then, and so on and so on, execute a traditional payload. Um, so uh, one of when attackers are writing exploits in malware, usually the first goal is to disable DEP so they can execute a, uh, a simpler traditional uh, exploit that they have somewhere in uh, uh, process memory. <clears throat> so to respond to this, to prevent attackers from just being able to turn off, you know, turn off the lights and turn off the security, um, they responded with something called permanent DEP. 
And it's basically the I really mean it bit. You know, don't turn this off. And the uh, thing is, applications have to opt into this feature, and it's off by default. <laughs> so, and seeing that is unfortunately common, that off by default thing, you have to opt in. So defenses evolved to mitigate early ROP attacks. Um, and so attackers evolved their techniques as well. And this brings us to the core of return-oriented programming theory. In that I don't have to just find existing instructions already in memory. I have to find, I can just use byte sequences in memory that uh, come out to valid instructions. So uh, I'm sure during some demo or some of your own work when doing exploit development, you've seen the, the errors, segmentation fault, and also invalid instruction. Now, invalid instruction is when uh, EIP points to some byte sequence, the processor fetches it, it decodes it, and it doesn't decode to a valid opcode. In other words, it doesn't know what it's looking at, so it throws invalid instruction error. So, as long as we have some byte sequence in memory, there's a valid instruction, we can get it to basically perform a malicious computation. So this code on the right, B889410863, is actually move EAX and then this, uh, this value. However, if you just look at 894108C3, it actually decodes to two opcodes. Move ECX plus 8 EAX, so move EAX into ECX plus 8, wherever that address is pointing, and then return. So that's fascinating. And this is the core of ROP. So instead of just returning to library code, you can return into the middle of existing functions. And better than that, you can return into the middle of existing instructions. And so attacker just basically uses these uh, valid instructions to perform whatever they need. And so this is basically the, the highest level of code reuse. Reusing things that weren't intended to be co uh, code itself uh, for your attack. So in the terminology of return-oriented programming, these things are called gadgets. So basically, gadgets are commonly a single instruction followed by a return. And so you chain together gadgets to perform some higher level function. And so these three gadgets, pop EAX return, pop ECX return, move into the address represented by ECX, the value stored in EAX return, actually performs everything necessary when you combine it with the right parameters on the stack to store immediate value. And that's a higher level gadget. So what attackers do is they scan common DLLs that are usually included on every single system that perhaps don't have ASL or compiled. And what they do is they find all the gadgets in that DL. And they form a catalog of these gadgets. Basically, you just look for some useful instruction and then return sequence. And then you chain these together to form basically a higher level function. And what attackers get from this is they can actually form Turing complete catalogs of gadgets. And so I'll cover Turing completeness if you haven't taken a theory or a compiler's class. Basically, a system of data manipulation rules, in other words, an instruction set, is said to be Turing complete if, if it can be used to simulate any single tape Turing machine. Now I know that doesn't help anyone in the room that's not familiar with it. It's like using the word to define itself. So basically, the, the common criteria for Turing completeness is that you have some capability to do conditional branching, and you have the ability to modify any value in uh, memory at any location. All right? So ROP gadgets on their own manually are going to be very difficult to work with, just like ASCII shellcode. Finding the things there, you know, finding the valid you know, instructions and putting together something manually is maddening. 
So you basically you construct by building a scanner uh, or using an existing one. By now, uh, there's definitely uh, many free and available ROP catalog and scanners. You basically establish a ROP catalog for whatever DLL you want to use, and then that catalog can be seen as an instruction set. Now, what you can do with this, since you have a Turing complete instruction set, or you can, well, <clears throat> that's not going to guaranteeably give you a Turing complete instruction set. Um, you have to do testing um, and make sure you have conditional branching and all, everything else. There may not, the DLL may be too short and it may not have all the instructions available in one form or another to do those things. If your DLL is only 10 lines of code, you can obviously see that why that would be the case. So, hope maybe you get a Turing complete instruction set, maybe you don't. The reason I'm talking about Turing completeness is that in the initial paper by Hovaf Shacham, when he introduced ROP to us, to us mere mortals, they built a <laughs> compiler using this instruction set and uh, assembled quicksort using only ROP. And so that proves that basically you can build a Turing complete compiler out of a ROP catalog for some for some DLL or module. Um, and so by now there's actually uh, just basically exploit compilers and assemblers that you can provide a ROP catalog and a DLL and it will give you essentially the ability to code C level code into basically ROP sequences. So it makes exploit development so much easier. And there's tools to do this now. The initial paper uh, prevented one, uh, provided one that return-oriented quicksort uh, uh, proof. And then these are just ones I found by Google searching. Um, there's a GitHub one called Roxy. And so in 2010, basically, the main thing attackers wanted to defeat was debt. And, uh, the first thing you do in your basic exploit, is since ROP is, was still difficult at the time, and difficult to think about, and there weren't a lot of tools out there, is basically you use it for a limited part. You use it to feed depth, and then you execute a traditional payload. So the thing about depth is it does not prevent the allocation of more memory segments. So you can allocate another page and give it permissions to write and execute. And then you can write your... You can write your shell code there and then point EIP to it and execute, and it'll all be fine. And so the, there are various methods that were uh, commonly used in ROP presentations or ROP malware to do this. Um, and I've listed sources for each one that I uh, found. So here's one at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> the virtual protect function, essentially you give it some address um, you tell it to make page execute read write so that makes it executable. Sorry, this this line should be here on the comment it wrapped around. And then all you do is you basically jump to that page and it will execute. So data execution prevention is essentially defeated because you're, you have the ability to write and execute to the same memory. So nowadays, it's very common when you're working with DEP to also find ASLR <laughs> defending an application. And this makes return-oriented programming very difficult because you have to know where these instructions are in memory in order to reliably point to them. So the, the opcode ret sequence, if the base of that segment is randomized, it's not going to be the same place every time it's started. So you, f you effectively have to get lucky if you're trying to combat ASLR using return-oriented programming or any other <laughs> return-oriented technique. <clears throat> or, as we're seeing now uh, in increasingly frequency, you have to discover some sort of address disclosure vulnerability. Now, an address disclosure vulnerability basically allows uh, you to see, it reveals where the address of something is in the memory usually is some fixed, uh, is some common global variable. And given that, you can see by uh, disassembling it yourself, from that point, 
you can find somewhere else in memory just by offset and address it. So if you expose somewhere in that block, the base of that block is going to be randomized, but everything in it is going to be the same. The contents aren't going to be scrambled. It's going to be the same as it was before without randomization. It's just the start of that address block is somewhere different. So if you can find somewhere in that block and expose the, the address of it, you can address things inside that block relatively. And so it, in the case of that, um, full ASR is still possible to exploit. Now let's talk about reality. Modules have to opt in to DEP and ASLR. If you have a DLL that you include and it's not compiled with ASLR, it can be used in a ROP attack quite reliably. And so I feel like I should mention again, perhaps the third time, that if you have a, a jailbroken phone, uh, DEP is probably not going to be available or NX is not going to be available because operating support uh, for NX effectively has to be broken in some cases uh, to jailbreak the phone. So what is the danger? Why, why do you have to opt in as opposed to opt out? It must be something that would break. That's, that's usually the case with many security uh, mechanisms that they're established. Uh, maybe they're established to prevent attacks doing this common thing. Maybe there's existing applications that use the same sort of techniques in their features. So instead of breaking all those things, we allow people to opt into these defenses. Don't uh, the addresses of DLLs be built anyway? Because they might conflict with their DLLs, so they have to be able to be shipped in memory. So the addresses of DLLs are loaded in like a, a fixed window. So yeah. So like. Why would it be able to opt into A also? Uh, there's uh, a compiler flag, and why would it? Uh, I, I mean, I guess the same thing. It, it may have broken some, not the DLLs features, but some applications that use those DLLs. What I'm saying is the address of the DLLs is not static. Like, right. So, I mean, you can't make an application that depends on the address being static because if you, like, if you basically, a DLL can ask for an address space, but if it clicks with another DLL, the operating system has the ability to move it to a different, like, you know, offset it by some. Right, and that's all handled by the loader. Okay. So the loader populates this table to help, you know, the application where these things are, and then it handles filling in things. What I'm asking is why the DLL has any input on address. Yeah, at all because they should just make it all of the loaders make everything randomized. I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to research more into that to answer that better. So there are entire databases of rock gadget chains and catalogs nowadays, and uh, the criteria for these two databases is that they have to work on Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows Seven, Windows Eight. Um, so it's pretty restrictive criteria. It has to be effectively universal in order to be included. Um, and they have to c exploit common DLLs on those uh, platforms. And so it's pretty widespread nowadays that we're having that level of support. So here's an example of ROP chain. You see a lot of basically pop, return, jump, pop, 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 and so on and so on. So To wrap things up on return-oriented programming, with CDECL, you're going to have to clean up your arguments, and you have to do an effective uh, number of pops uh, to clean up the corresponding number of arguments if you're returning to any fu uh, standard function. Um, but if you're just using gadgets to uh, straight up uh, perform malicious computations that's outside or independent of any you know, existing function, that's basically going to be the same technique independent of the function calling declaration standard. So that's going to be the same regardless of CDEC or standard call. However, if you're basically calling functions in standard call, you don't have to use gadgets to clean up the stack. So it makes things a little easier because the function that you call will be compiled to clean up the stack. So that makes life simpler.
<clears throat> so in conclusion, ROP is very commonly used uh, to basically uh, perform a preliminary stage in an exploit to disable or bypass DEP, <coughs> and then to execute a more traditional payload. So bypassing DEP under ASLR requires at least one module that is not opted in to ASLR. Bypassing DEP under full ASR, in other words, every DLL is compiled with ASLR and uh, DEP, effectively requires utilizing some uh, memory address disclosure vulnerability as well as a memory corruption vulnerability. So it raises the stakes, but it doesn't make it impossible. So the key lesson from the whole series of exploit development lectures that end now is that preventing the introduction of malicious code is not enough for preventing the execution of malicious computations. And so even though finding vulnerabilities gets harder and harder uh, and reliable exploitation gets uh, harder and harder as well, actually finding vulnerabilities gets easier and easier <laughs> and finding exp uh, making exploits gets harder and harder. Um, we're going to still continue to see this cat and mouse game of, okay, to defend against that, I'm going to do this. All right, to bake that defense, I'm going to do that. And so it's going to go on for basically forever. And so these are some resources for doing a project if you perhaps want to do a term project on returning to programming, um, which my criteria would be completely open-ended because it's essentially um, a very new subject. And by that, I mean six years. Um, I'd be willing to let you do anything you think of uh, within reason. So <clears throat> this is a gentle introduction. This is the talk that I mentioned at the beginning that I took a lot of uh, material from. Um, it's an extremely good talk. Um, and then here are some tutorials on how to develop exploits that are return-oriented programming, uh, similar. And basically, uh, well, this is one database. I linked two databases. There's a Metasploit database for ROP gadgets. Any questions? No questions, just blank stares. So either I lost everyone or everyone's just like, you know, ready for it to be the weekend and ready for it to be spring break. Yes? Yes. Regular code doesn't have like pop-up So wouldn't it be like wouldn't that be a pre-notice Hmm. So let's assume you're analyzing the input to a function that way, and you have that capability, right? So effectively, what you could do is you could take whatever data for every little form of an application that can be used for input for every vector, you effectively analyze it, you filter it. Um, I guess in a sense, however, uh, hmm, you wouldn't be able to emulate it unless you basically recreate an entire exact image of the target process. And that's infeasible for every little, every single time input is taken to an application, that's infeasible. What you could do is you could decode, attempt to decode whatever the instructions are. So if the problem with that is that normal uh, string or normal application data may just be valid data and it's not being used as part of basically a buffer overflow attack. It may translate to a, you know, a high frequency uh, occurrence of pop, you know, opcode pop, opcode, sorry. <coughs> opcode return, opcode return, opcode return sequences. So just filtering by that heuristic can uh, can deny a number of valid requests to an application. Um, and usually that is a bad uh, trait for a defense. So in theory, yes, you could. However, you would see a lot of normal requests and normal data with your application being rejected. And the user would just be like, what is going on? So. So, so Rob 
It still depends on a buffer overflow. It depends on a memory corruption vulnerability. So buffer overflow, yes. And you're just constructing a sequence of calls to other functions and passing along, you're building a stack with all the arguments you want and all the calls you want. Exactly. You want. And so the core of ROP extends beyond just reusing existing functions. It, it, the core of ROP is really you use existing sequences of uh, opcodes or existing bytes that render the decode to valid opcodes to do whatever you need to do. In functions, there's going to be a lot of irrelevant computations for an attacker. So it may be simpler to, instead of call an existing function, call to gadgets. just do a specific series of gadgets to do what you wanted to do instead. Good question. Is there a way to do memory corruption without buffer overflow? Uh, so usually combinations of vulnerabilities like uh, Integer overflows and integer vulnerabilities and string format vulnerabilities allow for this. This is true.